All right, let's say a few more words about the rate of homogeneous nucleation. So the rate of transformation overall is going to have to do with more than just the ease of nucleation. If something's really easy to nucleate, right? If you can form these nuclei really easy, that doesn't tell you the total transformation rate. It takes into account that, but it also matters on some other things. So first off, the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate but it also depends on the frequency of attachment of new atoms, right? So let's calculate these two things. First off, how do we calculate the number of stable nuclei, n star, that we have at any given point, right? Well, we have an expression for it. n star, the number of critical nuclei, is equal to k1, some constant, multiplied by the exponential of negative delta g star, our activation energy for nucleation, divided by thermal energy, kBT. Now, normally when we see something like this, this looks like a typical Arrhenius equation, um, and so you'd expect that at higher temperatures you have more of them. But that's a, there's a catch here. This term, delta g star, remember that it has a 1 over t squared term in it, right? If we go back up to our expression for it here, it had this 1 over t squared term in it. So we need to take into account that, right? Therefore, it's what it's going to look like, if you plotted this against temperature, you'd have the following. So this would be n star down here, how many you have. This would be temperature up here. This is temperature alpha beta, the temperature at which you'd expect it to happen. What we find is that n star goes like this. As you get lower and lower in temperature, n star gets larger. You get more of these things, which makes sense. As you super cool something, you're getting more and more of these nuclei are satisfying the criteria. They're, they're larger than that critical size, and so more of them are going to be stable, right? Now, the next thing we need to think about is the attachment frequency. With what frequency do new atoms diffuse to the surface of your material of this nuclei that's stable and attach to its surface, right? So that V sub D, the frequency of attachment, V sub D, well, it's also going to look like an Arrhenius equation. It requires diffusion though, right? So that's what's going to be the activation energy. Negative Q sub D is our activation energy for diffusion. So the expression for V sub D, our attachment frequency, is going to be equal to K2, some constant, multiplied by the exponential of our activation energy for diffusion divided by thermal energy. And since activation for energy of diffusion, this thing is not temperature dependent, therefore we'd expect this curve to look slightly different than the previous one. Again, plotting it as a function of temperature, we already know that n star looks like this, right, the amount down here on the x-axis, right? But this one, the attachment frequency is going to look like this. The attachment frequency is larger at higher temperatures because it's a typical thermally activated process. And again, this is all happening below T alpha beta, the temperature at which you'd expect the transition to occur. So what's the takeaway here? You can't have just one or the other. At, really, at temperatures just below the surface, you're not going to have very many nuclei, but the attachment rate will be really fast and the temperature's really far below it, super cooled, you could have lots and lots of stable nuclei, but they're going to attach really slowly. Therefore, the overall nucleation rate, this is capital N dot, that's going to be the number of nuclei formed per unit volume per second. It's equal to A star, that's the number of atoms at any given time they're at the surface of a critical nuclei, n star, that's our number of critical nuclei, multiplied by V sub D, the attachment frequency. So you can collapse all these constants, K1, K2, and K3 together, and then you're going to multiply them by exponential of negative activation energy for homogeneous nucleation, divided by thermal energy, and activation energy, exponential of negative activation energy, divided by thermal energy, right? So this overall rate, and what we see is that the overall rate, the maximum, will actually look something like this n star, n dot, will be at a maximum in some intermediate temperature. It's not like it's really close to the temperature of transformation or really far below. It's going to be at some intermediate value. You will see a maximum in your nucleation rate. Now, heads up, just a reminder again, that all of this that we've done so far only works for spheres, right? We had spherical nucleation. So if you had cubes or triangles or whatever else, you would have to redo this math for that shape, but it's a relatively straightforward thing. You just need the volume and the surface area of those shapes, and then you take the derivatives just as we did before and solve for them. 
And for me, one of the takeaways here is that this delta T, the amount of undercooling you can get, it can be hundreds of degrees, right? So a phase diagram or these, yeah, these phase diagrams are really helpful in that they tell you what happens where, but you had to consider kinetics, which we're doing in this chapter, to take into account, okay, how fast will things actually happen? And because of things, kinetic barriers like surface areas, you can actually get things deviating pretty dramatically from what you would have expected from a thermodynamic phase diagram because thermodynamics didn't account for kinetics.